So uh, today we're in part five of our series on the life of David, uh, who's called a man after God's own heart. And, and we're tracking through some of the most significant events and significant seasons of David's life. And we're trying to discover how his life story can help you and I to write a better story with our life. And, and today we're gonna learn a valuable lesson from David about pain, because pain is just part of life. Pain is part of our experience in this life. And as Christians, we believe that in a world that is full of sin, there is going to be a world of pain also. So David's gonna teach us a lot about how to interpret pain and how to respond to pain. And that's what we're gonna track with today. But before we do that, I wanna tell you about a few weeks ago. Um, a few weeks ago, it was the last week of school. And not only was it the last week of school, but it was the next to last day of school. And, and I picked up the boys, that, that, was, that was my job. Most days, Allison drops them off and I pick them up. And, and so I, I'm always the pickup guy. And when I pull up, you know, it happens just as it always does, you know, the boys get in and, you know, I wait for a minute, make sure everybody's in, make sure all the arms and legs are in, you know, the doors are shut, make sure there's nobody in front of the vehicle that I'm gonna run over, make sure that I get out in an appropriate, you know, fast amount of time so that the person behind me doesn't try to run over me because the drop-off line at school and the pickup line at school, it's not a place for mercy, it is not a place of grace, it is not a place of compassion, it is dog eat dog. It is, hey, only the fittest will survive. And so I'm making sure everything's in order and, and they get in. I'm like, everybody in, everybody's in. And so I start taking off and then I, I turn and I'm like, hey, how was your day? And then I, I, I look back, you know, Shepard's sitting in the front and then Grayson, he's sitting right behind Shepard in the second row. And I look back to Grayson as I always do. And I'm like, hey, tell me about your day. And when I look back, th this is what I see. You know, this is Grayson. And I'm like, what in the world? I mean, you know, you can see it's already turning purple and it's red and there's an abrasion and it's like, oh my gosh. I looked at him and said, what in the world have you done to your face? What have you done to your face? And you know, I'm a dad and I'm a proud dad and you know, I'm already, I, I think I already know what's happened. I, I've already created the scenario on which this has taken place because I'm thinking, well, obviously he's gotten into a fight and, and not just into a fight because he's a troublemaker, but probably one of his friends was getting picked on by a bully. And he stepped in to say, hey, you, you don't pick on my friend. And, and the bully's like, well, what are you gonna do about it? And he said, well, you keep on doing it. I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do about it. And, and then maybe the bully, he took one swing and that's, that's it. That's the only one that he got in. And then Grayson levels him, brings him to the knees of defeat. And then the bully looks up and says, Grayson, I'm so sorry for picking on your friend. I've learned my lesson. I'll never be a bully. So I'm thinking of this as a dad. I'm thinking, well, that's what's had to have happened. And so I'm saying, hey, what'd you do to your face? And I'm expecting some big story of valor and nobility. And I'm sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for Grayson to tell me the story. And Grayson says, I ran into a pole, dad. Okay. So I said, Grayson, was this a new pole that someone placed on the playground overnight that you weren't aware of? And Jesus, no. Said, okay, so you knew the pole was there? Yes. That means that you saw the pole? Yes. So what you're telling me, son, is that you ran into a pole that you knew was there that you seen beforehand, but you ran into it anyway. Yeah, dad, that's what happened. Okay, son, we're gonna tell everybody you got in a fight. And, and this is how it goes. You know, uh, and I'm like, what? You ran into the pole? And so that was the next last day of school. Well, then the next day, of course, was the last day of school. And Allison went and I went to Shepherd's academic uh, banquet. And, and so we sat through that and um, hung out, you know, a little bit with him afterward and talked to some other parents. And, and we knew we had a little bit of time uh, between that event and when the boys needed to be picked up. So Allison says, I, I got to run to a couple stores, so let's go there. So I, I did what every good husband, you know, does in that event. I drop her off at the door so she can go in so I can find something else to do rather than shop. I said, I got to go to another store. I need to check on a couple things and I'll be in there in just a minute. And so that's what I did. Uh, I, I went to go, you know, look on a few things that I was looking for, didn't find them, came back. I was getting ready to go in and meet her and she calls me and she says, I'm on my way back out. And I said, well, that was fast. And she says, well, we got to go pick up Grace. And they just called from, from the nurse's station. And, and the nurse said, you know, Grayson never complains about anything. You know, he, he, he's never really emotional, but he certainly never cries about anything. He's just super tough. 
and, and he's in the nurse's office and, and he can't hardly talk because he's, he's hurt his ankle. So we're about five minutes away. We drive down to Grayson's Elementary School and, and I go in and I, I walk upstairs in the nurse's uh, office and, and this, is, this is how I'm greeted uh, by Grayson. This is Grayson. He's in the wheelchair now. And, and, and of course, that's where he got into the fight with the bully the day before and uh, defending the honor of one of his friends. And you can see his ankle, it's already, it's kind of turning purple and green and it's already, you know, swelling up and, and he can't hardly talk. And I mean, I'm talking about, this guy's tougher than nails. I mean, he, he doesn't, he, you know, he just kind of even killed. And I knew when I saw him, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, he's hurt because this is so out of character. And, and, and so we get him downstairs and I pick him up, I put him in the car and uh, me and his mom, we take him to the emergency room and, you know, they do their things, they x-ray him and, and all of that. So, you know, me, Allison, Shepard and Grayson in the ER for like the next hour and a half. And they come back and they say, nothing's broke, but you know, it's just a, you know, a mid to a bad sprain. And the thing was in, in about a week's time, we were supposed to take the boys to camp and they were gonna go to camp in Georgia for two weeks. And we were like, oh my goodness, I hope that Grayson doesn't miss camp because they look forward to this all year long. And, and so we were like, we got to get him ready for camp, got to get him ready for camp. Well, the, the doctors, you know, they came in and they were like, hey, listen, you know, we think that his injury is bad enough. We're going we're gonna to put him in a boot and we're going to put him on some crutches uh, in order to try to get him better uh, a little bit faster and get him ready so he's ready to go to camp in, in just a little over a week's time. So, you know, after all was said, and done. This is Grayson after, you know, all the x-rays and all the things, and he's got his crutches and he's got his boot on. And again, you know, where he fought off that bully on, on the day before, he's got all of that going on. And, and so we go home. And, and so for the next few days, um, Grayson is walking on crutches and he just thought it was the greatest thing in the world, you know, and he was actually pretty good with it. Uh, how many of you all have been on crutches at some point in yeah, obviously got one right down here. And so a lot of us, some of us, some of us didn't play a lot as children and uh, we don't play a lot of as adults. And I don't know how you could make it to this point in your life and not have had crutches, but, but there he was, he had crutches and he was kind of liking it. You know, he, he, he was getting fast and he was just everywhere. And, and so everywhere we would go, of course, you know, the first question that people would ask is, oh my goodness, what happened? And I would just, you know, say to Grace, just tell him about the ankle, son. Just tell him about the ankle. Don't talk about the cheek. Uh, let's not go into that. And, and so he would tell them, and then, you know, like in classic older brother fashion, you know, Grace would say, you know, I, I, I got a sprain, and, you know, they put me in this boot and put me on these crutches, and then, you know, Shepard would cross his arms and say, it's more like a mild sprain. It's not that big of a deal. And so this went on for days. And then, you know, Grayson, he's, everywhere he goes in the house, he's got his crutches. Everywhere we go, he's got his crutches. And after a few days, we were like, okay, G, you're gonna have to start walking some without your crutches. And he's like, well, what do you mean? You know, I, I, I don't wanna walk without my crutches. My, my ankles hurt. And, and we started talking about, you know, crutches are good, uh, but if you hold on to them for too long, uh, they can actually hurt and not help. Um, crutches, when, you know, they're measured right and when you use them right and they're applied appropriately, you know, they're a good thing. But, but actually, crutches can become a bad thing if you, you know, are using the crutch in the wrong way and if you hold on to it for too long. Uh, crutches, if you've ever had them and if you're a medical provider of any kind, you know this. Uh, crutches were never intended to be any kind of sustainable solution uh, to the pain that we find ourselves in, or it, it's not a sustainable solution to whatever injury uh, we have perhaps, you know, uh, come down with or, you know, been afflicted with. Uh, they're just not a sustainable solution to our pain. Uh, crutches are what you lean on when you're hurt. Crutches are what you lean on when you're in pain, when you're injured. And, and it helps to give a little temporary stability. Uh, uh, it gives you a sense of balance. And it helps you to stand when you can't stand on your own. That's crutches. They help you to walk when you can't walk forward on your own. But when it comes to crutches, sooner or later, you're gonna have to lay the crutches aside and you're gonna have to confront your pain. You're gonna have to confront your injury and you're gonna have to heal from it. And so we were talking to G and we're like, hey, you, you gotta lay aside the crutches and you gotta walk some without it. And, and so, you know, he didn't want to, but we took the crutches away and then he was hobbling along and limping along. And, and, and then thankfully by the time that camp came, he was, he was ready to go. But that's the nature of crutches and that's the nature of pain. Crutches are what we lean on 
when we're hurt. Crutches are what we lean on when we're in pain. And, and this is a question that I want us to wrestle with uh, for the remainder of our time together. Here, here's my question to you, and this is what I want you to hold on to as we talk about what we're gonna talk about today. What do you lean on most when life hurts? When life hurts and there's pain and, and you're injured or you're wounded in some way, and, and there's gonna be pain in this life, it's unavoidable, it's inevitable, what do you lean on? Who do you lean on? Because you're gonna lean on something. Who or what do you lean on most when life is hard, when life hurts, when life isn't working out the way that you thought life should work out? Uh, what do you do? Who do you turn to? Who do you lean on? What do you lean on when you're hurting, when you're angry, when you're depressed, when you're stressed, when you're lonely, when you're rejected, when you're betrayed? Who or what do you lean on? Because you lean on something, I lean on something. What is it that we use as a crutch? What do we lean on? when life is hard, when life hurts. Uh, a lot of people, uh, their crutch is a coping mechanism and, and they have all kinds of coping mechanisms. Uh, we have the ability to develop all kinds of coping mechanisms. For some people, it's denial. They, they just deny, 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 deny. They put their head in the clouds, they put their head in the sand and, and they just ignore pain. They ignore wounds, they ignore reality, they ignore the circumstances in front of them and, and they just live in denial. They just live in denial. Uh, they deny what is real. They deny the pain. They deny their story. They deny the circumstances. Some people, their coping mechanism, their crutch is self-medication. And so some people, you know, they take not only medicine, but they take more medicine than's been prescribed. Some people get to the place where they take medicine that's not even been prescribed to them. Uh, some people, they not only drink, but they drink so much that they can't feel, so they don't want to feel. Uh, and, and it's just, a way to kind of go through life numb. So they're just self-medicating this way or that way. Uh, for some people, they just, hey, they just run away. That's what they do. Uh, going gets tough. Life hurts. You know, there's difficulty. There's adversity. Uh, some people, their first inclination is just run away. I'm going to run away from the relationship. I'm going to run away from the job. I'm going to run away from them. I'm just going to run away. Uh, some people, they distract themselves with pleasure. And so they just try to find one thing after the other that will serve as some type of indulgence or some type of distraction. And all of these things, they're just crutches that we lean on when life hurts, when we're hurt, when we're injured. So hold on to the question, what do you lean on most when life hurts? Just hold on to that because you lean on something. I hold on to something, I lean on to something. And this is a question that brings us back to David. Because David has a lot to teach us as it relates to pain, as it relates to crutches. Now, the last time that we talked about David's life, we talked about his monumental victory over Goliath. And, and on the hills of David's monumental win over Goliath, David became a national hero. Uh, he was flung into the spotlight of a nation uh, that was void of real leadership. Uh, he was thrust into the spotlight of a nation that was thirsty and hungry for real leadership. Uh, so when David kills Goliath, his popularity is at an all-time high. His popularity is soaring. And people everywhere are talking about David. They're talking about David around the dinner table. They're talking about David down at the town, town square. They're talking about David, you know, at the local pub. They're talking about David in the halls of the palace. They're talking about David, you know, on the battlefield among the soldiers of Israel. And the reason that people are so, you know, mesmerized and, and, and just captivated by David is the fact that he's, he's this rare blend of qualities that we rarely see converge on just one person. He's, he's tenacious, but yet he's tender. Um, he's a warrior, but yet he's a poet. His hands are skilled for war. I mean, he can kill a giant, he can kill a bear, he can kill a lion, but his hands are so skillful that he can make music on stringed instruments. I mean, it's just an amazing set of qualities. He's decisive, but yet he's humble. He's strong, but approachable. He's wise, but relatable. He's convictional, but yet he's compassionate. And when people looked at David, they loved David. They were drawn to David. And not only did they talk about David and celebrate David, they actually wrote songs about him. Uh, in 1 Samuel 18, right on the hills of his win over Goliath, it says, and they danced, they sang, and here was the song, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now David is a man of the people. He, he's a man for the people. He's, he's the champion of Israel right now. And everybody loves him. Everybody's drawn to him. And why wouldn't they be? I mean, he's a winner. 
He finds a way to end up on top almost every single time. And, and as people, we love that. We, we love an underdog. And he was an underdog shepherd who took down Goliath. And, and he's just this amazing you know, set of qualities. And so people, people love him. Everybody loves him except for one. And that's King Saul, the current king of Israel. In the same text, it says that Saul was very angry. So well, why was he very angry? Because this refrain, this song that people were singing displeased him greatly. He says, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. Now, Saul is so insecure and, and there's a lot to talk about as it relates to insecurity in King Saul, but, but I just want you to listen to how small he makes himself sound, how weak he positions himself. David, they're saying, killed tens of thousands, but me, poor me, little me, I've just killed thousands. And, and insecurity, it always causes us to take the posture of weakness. Insecurity always causes us to take the posture of us against the world. You know, it's me against everybody else. And, and that's kind of where Saul was. And it's like people are singing about David. And if David is successful, if they think David's successful, they must think I'm a failure. And if they think that David is great, they must not think that I'm great. And, and that's how insecure people think. And not only that, but it goes on and it says, but Saul from that time on kept a close eye on David. And, and really in the Hebrew, it, it says that he kept a jealous eye on David. Now, Saul's insecurity wouldn't allow him to celebrate David's successes. And again, if you're a leader of any kind, and everybody here is a leader of some kind, maybe at work, maybe in your company, maybe at home, maybe on the team, maybe in the classroom, in your social circle, whatever it is, insecurity will keep you and keep me from celebrating other people's successes. And that's the reason that insecurity is such a, it's one of the many reasons why insecurity is this toxic thing that too many of us, we tolerate in our life. Uh, insecurity causes you and me to become so self-centered, so self-consumed, so self-in love that, that we cannot for a moment acknowledge someone else's greatness without thinking it's a knock against us. We can't celebrate somebody else's success or accomplishment without taking it personal about our own story and about our own resume. That's what insecure people do. Insecure people, Insecure people are difficult people to follow as leaders. And Saul's insecurity is gonna be one of the things that leads to the end of his kingdom, his kingship, his leadership. But more than just insecurity, there was something else going on in the life of Saul. And, and the text tells us what it is. It says, the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. Now, there's a lot of questions that, that this you know, causes us to ask, you know, was, was this from God? You know, how does an evil spirit get sent from God on someone? You know, was this sent from God? Was this allowed by God? And there's a lot of great questions and a lot of worthy questions to talk about and to research and, and to try to have an opinion on. But at the end of the day, there's not a 100% answer, 100% answer to, to, to those particular questions. The important thing, I think, is that when we take what the scripture says here, that God either designed this or God allowed this, but either way, it was what it was and it did what it did in the life of Saul. And as you read the life of Saul, I think you can think of it, you know, in a little bit more robust terms because this sounds like something, you know, super spiritual, you know, invisible. This, this sounds like something that's happening on another realm, but this is so practical. Uh, this is like shoes on the ground rubber meets the road. Uh, when you read the rest of the stories connected to Saul, you're going to find out that this, this evil spirit that came upon Saul, you could also think of it in terms of this relentless emotional storm. Uh, that's really what comes upon Saul. It's this relentless emotional storm that psychologically upends Saul to the point that it borders on madness. He's just upended psychologically, emotionally. He's not able to think clearly. His emotions are not very trustworthy. And he's just in this relentless emotional storm. And truth be told, Saul is dealing with some type of mental illness, a significant mental illness. And there's little question to that. Matter of fact, when a lot of psychologists and counselors and experts, when they read the life of Saul, he really becomes a case study for somebody who has one manic episode, one after the other, after the other, after the other. You never know which Saul's gonna show up because he's all over the emotional spectrum. One day he's up, the next day he's down. 
Uh, one day he's your friend, one day he's your foe. Uh, one day he cheers you on, the next day he curses you. So he's all over the place. And, and as you read the, the story of King Saul, sometimes it's like he's guided by toxic emotions, but, but too many times more than not, he seems to be controlled by unhealthy, toxic emotions like jealousy, paranoia, self-preservation, insecurity. It, it just keeps on going. He, he's just not guided by these emotions. At times it seems like he's, he's actually controlled by them. And when you read the life of King Saul in the scriptures, you see a man from this point on who is spiraling out of control. And matter of fact, he spirals out of control so much he resorts to violence. Uh, the text goes on and says that he was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, the stringed instrument, as he usually did. And Saul had a spear in his hand. Well, you know, it's the king's spear and, you know, the king can have in his hand whatever he wants. And so David, David's singing, maybe a new song that he's written, new melody that he's put together. And all of a sudden, as he's singing and playing for Saul, because you remember back in week two, you know, Saul, he's already got, you know, some of these, you know, foreshadows of mental illness and, and he's kind of up and down and he's all over the place and, and David steps in to serve the king with music and it, it kind of soothes Saul and, and so David's doing that and as he's doing that it says the spear that Saul had in his hand he hurled it at David saying to himself I'll pin David to the wall but David eluded him twice and so David's singing for him David's playing for him and Saul just tries to kill him and David's thinking well you know I didn't like the song that great either but come on man it's not that bad and so David eludes him not once, but twice. And so Saul's unhinged, he, he's out of control. And his bloodthirst only increases from this moment on because he's convinced, he's convinced that his greatest threat and his greatest enemy to his happiness in his future is David. And again, that's what insecure people always do. They blame somebody else for how they feel. They blame other people for how they react and respond. They blame other people and say, that's the reason I'm not happy. That's the reason it hasn't worked out. They're the reason it's not gonna work out. And that's what David does. And that's why, again, I, I, it's just such a part of the text. Insecure people, whether it's you or me, insecure people will always end up undermining the relationship that they're involved in. Insecure people, insecurity will cause us to sabotage a relationship over and over and over and over again because we don't expect it to work out. We expect to end up on the short end of the stick and because of it, insecure people, they undermine whatever relationship that they're involved in and that's what Saul begins to do. David is his friend, but he makes David his friend enemy. And so Saul begins to think of ways to kill David after he misses him twice with a spear. So he, he thinks, okay, I'm not going to lift a hand. I'm just going to send him out to battle and he'll continue to fight the Philistines. And sooner or later, the law of statistics will land in my favor and David will get killed because sooner or later, when you keep on fighting in wars and battles, you're not going to come back home alive. But every time he sends David out to fight the Philistines, David comes back from the Philistines, a winner. And it just causes Saul to get that much more angry because David gets that much more popular and he's that much more loved by the people. And Saul just keeps on taking this all so personal. Well, then Saul finds out that his daughter, Michelle or Michael, is in love with David. Now, you might remember that Saul had already promised one daughter to David, but at the last minute kind of reneged on the promise and, and, and allowed the daughter to marry somebody else. But he finds out that, that Michelle or Michael is, is in love with David. And he thinks, okay, I'm gonna use my daughter to trap David so that I can kill him. And again, just to keep on beating the drum, that's insecurity. Insecure people don't value people. At the end of the day, they don't value people. They use people for their own means to their own end. And so he's using his daughter to get to David. So he marries his daughter off to David, but he says, okay, David, I want you to be my son-in-law. And David is so humble and he so loves the king and he so enjoys serving the king. He says, I'm not even worthy to be your son-in-law. I'm not even worthy to be your son-in-law. And he said this after he's already been, tried to be killed twice by his would-be father-in-law. And so David's like, I'm not even worthy to be your son-in-law. And, and Saul was like, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You know, let's just forget about, you know, the spear thing. I want you to marry my daughter. I think you're a great guy, really. I just had a bad day. And, and, and so David was like, oh, that would be such an honor. And, and, you know, in those days, you know, there was a dowry. There was a, there was a bridal price that you would pay the father to marry their daughter. And so Saul says, I'll tell you what the price is. Let's just say, um, I don't know, 
If you'll bring me back a hundred foreskins of the Philistine soldiers, then that will be your, your price that you have paid to marry my daughter. And, and David's probably thinking, a hundred foreskins? Who asks for a hundred foreskins? As awkward as that might be, David says, okay, okay, a hundred foreskins you want? Okay, I, I'm your man. I'll be your huckleberry. And so he goes, and not only does he bring back 100 uh, foreskins of the Philistines, he brings back 200 foreskins. I, I don't know if he put them in a box and wrapped them for Saul. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, if he just threw them on the grill and was like, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know what you do with that. I mean, and it's so awkward. It's so weird. And that's why we should read the Bible because it's entertaining. And, you know, you should just try to imagine these things. It's like David looks at his man and was like, okay, we got these, you know, whatever, the two, 198, 199, 200. Okay, we got 200 dead Philistines here. I'm going to need you guys to get me a knife. And it's like, well, why? You know, they're already dead. Well, you you know, I, I, I need their foreskin. Why? Well, you know, Saul asked, I mean, I don't even know how that all worked out. And then, you know, I don't know. Uh, I know that when I crappie fished with my grandpa growing up, you know, we catch a big thing of crappie, you know, you, you just run like this string through all the, the fish's mouth. I, I, I don't know if, I don't know. I don't know how you bring back 200 foreskins, but it was a thing and it happened. And so David comes back, he's alive. He's got 200, not 100. And again, Saul's plan, it just fails and he's infuriated. Now, after this takes place, Saul kind of regroups and he decides that he's gonna hire a group of assassins to go to his daughter's house where she's now married and living with David. So we're not sure how much time passes through all of this, but Saul puts out a hit on David and David finds out about it and he gets his wife, Michael, to help him out. And so she goes to David's bed and she puts a big idol underneath the covers and then she takes some, some goat's hair and puts on top of the idol to kind of be a, a stand-in for David, uh, a decoy. And, and again, and I've always been told that, that David is this great looking guy, but I'm thinking if, if an idol and some goat hair on top of it can double as you, bro, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what you had going on. Obviously, you had a lot of things going on that was in your favor and for your benefit, but you know, if, if an idol and goat's hair can kind of be a stand-in double for you, and, and that's what she did, and it worked, and it killed enough time for David to escape and, and to leave because he thought the best thing for me to do at this point is to just go on the run. And this is what is so important. For the next eight years, David will be on the run. The next eight years, he's going to be on the run from Saul. This is what the scripture says. Then David fled, and that's going to be the story of his life again for the next eight years. He fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan, and Jonathan was his best friend. This was Saul's son, and we may talk about this friendship in a couple of weeks, but Jonathan is, is David's absolute best friend, and he goes and he says to Jonathan, Saul's son, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Jonathan, you're my best friend on all of this earth, and I need you to help explain to me why. Why is this happening? I've only loved, served, and honored your father. Why is he trying to kill me? Now, what we see happening in, in this whole narrative is that beginning at this little season of David's life, life is being, you know, life is just chipping away at David's innocence, at whatever uh, naivety that he may have at this particular point in his life, uh, life's just chipping all of that away. And David, he understands that what has been happening to him is undeserved, it's, it's unfair, it's unwanted. Uh, it's not anything that is required because again, David has been a friend of the king. He's served the king, he's honored the king. He genuinely loves Saul and he can't figure out why in the world has Saul turned against me like this? Why is Saul trying to kill me? So he can't explain any of this. This is all painful. This, this is all wounding to David. Uh, this is really just, it's turning his world upside down and, and he just can't make sense of it. He can't control it. He can't stop it. Pain has entered into David's life in a way the pain has never entered into David's life before. It's a difficult season. And, and he's talking to Jonathan to just give you a little insight into his emotional you know, place that he's in. He says, there's only a step right now between me and death. You talk about pressure, you talk about stress. 
I mean, if you feel like there's only a step between you and death and you're running from death and, and death is right on your heels, do you imagine how stressful and how you know, much pressure that is? David, his life has been turned upside down and now God seems to be allowing it to be shaken. Everything that's been familiar to David, all of the crutches that he has carried with him through life that maybe he wasn't even aware that he had, all the things that he leaned on when life got tough and life hurt. All of a sudden, as Chuck Swindoll writes about this particular you know, portion of David's life, that God is now systematically one by one taking all the crutches away out of David's life. All the things that he's leaned on when life got hard and life hurt, God's taken away all of those crutches. And that's what the next eight years is all about. And so David, he's trying to figure out why in the world is all of this happening? Why is Saul doing this? Uh, matter of fact, I'm, I'm sure he was a little irritated because he could have thought to himself, well, Sam, Samuel the prophet, he didn't mention any of this at the first job interview when he brought that horn of oil and poured it over my head and told me that I was gonna be the next king of Israel. He didn't tell me that I was gonna be running for my life for like eight years. He left that part out. And so David's under constant threat. He's always looking over his shoulder. He's always looking around the corner. There's no rest when you're living life that way. There's very little sleep when you're living life that way. His home's taken away from him. And now he's fleeing in fear for his life. And so he leaves. And that's kind of the story of his life. It goes on. And after he talked to Jonathan, it says that David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech trembled when he met David. And he asked David, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? And it's this great story. And we've talked about it from the New Testament perspective because this particular passage was a big event in the life of Jesus when he was dealing with the, the self-righteous Pharisees one day and, and this event from David's life. But, but this is where that event uh, came from. It's where it originated. Uh, David goes to Nob and he meets with Ahimelech the priest because David's hungry and he has no food. So he has no other option and he's just trying to figure things out the best he can. He's trying to figure out how to put one foot in front of the other. And he's just, he's just, he's just reacting. That's all he's doing. He's just reacting. He's not thinking clearly. He's not thinking strategically. He's just, he's just, he's just reacting. And he goes to Ahimelech and he says, I need some food. I have no food. And Ahimelech says, what in the world are you doing here? And David, David tells him this big, hairy, monstrous lie. Uh, David looks at Ahimelech, the priest, and says, well, Saul has me on a secret mission. So you can't tell anybody that I'm here and, and I need some food. Well, the only food that was left was the, the bread that had been placed on the table of showbread in, in the tabernacle. And, and that bread was only supposed to be allowed, you know, it was only allowed to be eaten by the priest. Well, Ahimelech uh, ends up giving David uh, the bread that he was not supposed to give David. And David ended up eating the bread that he was not supposed to eat. But not only that, uh, David looked at Ahimelech, the priest and said, hey, do you have a weapon around here? And it didn't make sense to him, Alec, because if you're on a secret mission from the king, shouldn't you be, you know, a person with a weapon? And, and David, again, he's got all these stories that he tells. And, and so Ahimelech says, I've got the sword. And, and David said, what sword? He said, I've got the sword of Goliath, the sword that you used to cut off the head of Goliath. It's here. And David said, it's here. And, and so Ahimelech gives him the sword. And, and, it, and it's, it's almost like a divine nudge, I think, in reading this passage. Because in the story of Goliath, we found a David who showed up, who saw the enemy, heard the enemy, and decided not to run away, decided not to flee. He confronted the enemy, and not only did he confront the enemy, but he ran towards the enemy, and he killed the enemy, chopped off his head, and took his sword. And now it's this contrast of a David who's on the run, He's not the same guy that he was in chapter 17 when he ran towards the, the, the giant Goliath. He's not the same guy that we read about who killed the lion and killed the bear when they threatened his father's sheep. This is not the same guy. This guy is a guy who's running away. This is a guy whose life has been turned upside down and it's shaken and he can't tell up from down, left from right. This is a guy looking for a crutch. 
This is a guy looking to lean on something because life is hard and life hurts and there's a lot of pain right now that David's having to deal with and David's having to process. Now, while David is there talking to Ahimelech, there's another guy who's there as well, a guy by the name of Doeg. And this guy is loyal to King Saul. And, and Doeg, to give you, you know, kind of a story made short, Doeg is eventually gonna go tell Saul that he saw David talking to Ahimelech and that Ahimelech was helping David out. Now, because of David's choices, and because David is in search of all of these crutches to help him out in the time of his need, because David lied to Ahimelech and got Ahimelech to help him, Doeg went to Saul and told Saul what had happened, and Saul came and killed Ahimelech, killed Ahimelech's family, and killed the other priests that were there as well. So David's just making all kinds of decisions, and it's not only costly to him, but it's costing the literal lives of other people around him. So everything just seems to be falling apart for David. Uh, and so after Ahimelech, it says that day, David fled again, because that's what he's doing. He's just running from one place to the other. David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Now here's a question, who was from Gath? Goliath was from Gath. Why in the world would David want to go to Gath? There's no good reason why David would go to Gath. But again, he's upside down. He's shaken. He's afraid. He's on the run from Saul. And David himself is spiraling. He's on the run. He's scared. And he's just trying everything that he knows to try. So he goes to Gath. And we don't even know why. I don't even know if David knew why. But he goes to Gath, and of course, people think they recognize him. They were like, is this not the guy who killed Goliath? Is this not the guy they're singing about? And, and then David, he, it's just really kind of embarrassing. It's humiliating. Then, because he's so afraid that he's about to be outed, that he's going to be recognized, he begins to act insane. And he begins to claw himself, and he begins to scratch, you know, on the doors. And he, he allows, you know, just drool to come off of his chin. And, and he just pretends to be insane. And, and they bring him to the king of Gath. And, and it's kind of funny. The king looks at his, you know, his staff, his attendants, and he's like, what are you all doing? What are you all doing? Do you not think I already have enough nut jobs in this kingdom? You've brought me another one? I don't need this guy. I don't even know who this guy is. And, and, and it's kind of just this event. And, and then they kind of just... Send David on his way. And we don't even know why he was there, what he thought he was going to accomplish. It just didn't make any sense. And it's so out of character for the David that we've met and known up until this point. It says that David, on that day, he left Gath and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, this is going to be where David is going to hub out of uh, for the next few years. Uh, this is a picture of this general area that I took in our last trip to Israel. And if you're taking this picture looking this direction, back here uh, behind you is the Dead Sea. And, and in front of you is, is the area of En Gedi. And, and it's really close to the place where David killed Goliath. And this is the place that after David left Gath, he fled to this particular area. He, he fled to this wilderness area. And, and this is what this is referred to in the scripture and among the Jewish people. This is the wilderness. Doesn't look like a wilderness that we would think of. Uh, but, but this is David and he runs here. This is where he goes. And all throughout these caverns, there's caves. And, and, and there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of caves. And we don't know which cave David was in, but, but David ran away, running for his life. And, and somewhere in all of this, he finds a cave and he goes in and he, he just sits down in that cave. Now it may not be the bottom, but he can probably see the bottom from where he's at. He's lost his job. He's lost his wife. He's lost his home. He's lost his counselor, Samuel. He's lost his closest friend on earth, Jonathan. And he's even begun to lose his self respect. And here he is sitting in a dark cave in the middle of a barren wilderness. No one to talk to, no promise to cling to, no hope that anything would change or get better. The only thing that he is, he's alone in a cave. And in this dark cave, separated from everyone or everything that he's ever used as a crutch, Everything and everyone that he's ever leaned on when life hurt, when life was hard, God has been systematically taking those crutches away one after the other, after the other, after the other. And God brings him to this cave, this place of quietness. Because oftentimes it requires quietness to develop awareness. 
And the reason that sometimes you and I don't have the awareness that we require, that we need to live life the way that God has called us to live life, awareness about ourselves, awareness about God, awareness about other people, awareness about the world, is sometimes we don't allow ourselves to get to the place of quietness. It's quietness which precedes awareness. Awareness grows, it develops, it matures in the quietness of solitude. And that's where David's at. Because sometimes there's experiences and lessons that we can only learn in silence and solitude. Sometimes there's things that only you can figure out, that you need to figure out. And you're only gonna discover those things in silence and solitude. There's things about me, things about the world, things about you know, God, things about my future, things about my past, things about my present, that I'm, ever, I'm never gonna be able to figure out apart from silence and solitude. That's the reason most of us don't like silence and solitude. That's the reason we don't like downtime because in the downtime, in the silence, in the solitude, we begin to think about the hurt. We begin to think about pain. We begin to think about the difficulty of life. We begin to think about our story. We begin to think about our past. We begin to think about the things that are not comfortable to think about. That's the reason we resist quietness. We resist solitude. Uh, Nancy Newhall, who, who wrote about the wilderness, uh, she said that the wilderness is the place that holds the answers to the questions that we have not yet learned to ask. That's the reason the wilderness was always thought to be a very spiritual place for the people of Israel, because it was monochromatic. There was very little distraction. It was just non-domesticated. It was just a place of pause. It was a place where you could go and just be alone so you could think. And she says that sometimes God takes us to that place, that wilderness, that God drives us to a cave like David so that we can learn to ask the questions that we should be asking, so that we can learn the answers that we should be learning. And so David's in this cave and in the wilderness, life gets simplified. But just because life is simplified doesn't mean that it gets more shallow, it actually deepens. It gets uncluttered and David is able to have a perspective that he wasn't able to have before. He's able to learn some things that he wasn't able to learn before. He's gonna learn more about his purpose. He's gonna learn more about God's plan. David did not choose to go into the wilderness. Pain chased him into the wilderness. Pain drove him to the wilderness. Pain drove him to the cave that he's currently in. Now, and I'll give this to you and then we're wrapping it up. It's one thing to talk about David from the outside in, but, but the great thing about David is he wrote songs about this. He wrote poetry about this so that we can understand what was going on in the inside at this particular moment. And there's at least three Psalms that David wrote while he was in this, this cave, in this season of being in the cave in the wilderness. And it gives us insight to how he felt. Let me, let me give you a few of his words in it from his own pen. David says, I cry to the Lord. And he wrote this from the cave. He says, I plead for the Lord's mercy because th this is all excruciating. I pour out my complaints because I'm not happy about this. I, I tell them to God, I tell you God all my troubles. When I'm overwhelmed and I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way that I should turn because wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. He says, I, I have nowhere else to go. I, I don't know where to turn. I don't know who to trust. I, I don't know what I can lean on. I look for someone to come I look for someone to help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. Now he sounds a bit like Saul. Now he's feeling a bit sorry for himself. He says, no one gives me, nobody's thinking about me. Nobody cares about me. No one's gonna help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. If I never come back from this cave, nobody will notice, nobody will care. That's where he's at, that's David. Does this sound like David? in front of Goliath? No, does it sound like David, you know, in a lion's battle or a bear, you know, battle, you know, over his father? No, it doesn't sound like David. He goes on, he says, I'm in the midst, in another Psalm, Psalm 57, he says, I'm in the midst of lions. I'm forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. He says, I'm being hunted, I'm being hunted. And this is painful, this is miserable. And David, in the darkness and the silence and the solitude of that cave, he's left with only himself to confront what's going on in his life. All the crutches have been taken away. And there he is by himself. 
And this cave is gonna become a place of learning, of growing, of maturing, of training for David. And, and again, th this season of his life, it lasts for eight years. And we're not sure how long he's in the cave. We're not sure how long all of this takes, but over time, David's perspective begins to shift. He begins to see more clearly. He begins to sort out the healthy emotions from the unhealthy emotions. He, he gains awareness and, and he's able to say things like this. He says, then, then I pray to you, O Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. I have nowhere else to run. I have nowhere else to turn. I have nothing else to lean on. You are my refuge. You're all I really want in life. And it's, and it's become cliche and that's a tragedy, but it's true. When you get to the place where God is all you have, you realize more than at any other time, God is actually all you need. And sometimes God strips away everything else that we have when all that we're left is him so that we can realize in a way that we can learn no other way that he's actually all that we need. And, and this is God saying to David, David, I don't wanna be another crutch. I, I, I'm not a crutch, I'm not a tool in your chest that you can just pull out and just use when you need me or, or when something's difficult or somebody you turn to or I, I'm not a crutch. I wanna be your refuge. I, I want to be the person you run to, turn to, depend on, stand on, trust in. And that's what God is trying to get David to, that point where he realized, God, you are my refuge. He, he's able to say, in, in another Psalm, he said, God, my heart is steadfast, my heart is steadfast. I, I will sing and make music. And, and so there's a time and place where David actually gets into the silence and the solitude of the cave and he's able to sing again. He, he's able to have joy and peace again because it's pain that has chased David further into God's presence. It's pain that's drove David further into God's plan and further into God's love and further into God's mercy and further into God's grace. David wouldn't have gotten this deep apart from pain. David wouldn't have got to this moment, this realization, this perspective, this experience, apart from pain, chasing him there. And this is gonna be the place, this cave, this is gonna be the place where God teaches David how to be a king. You say, don't you learn how to be a king in a throne room? Not always. Sometimes you learn to be a king in a cave. Sometimes you learn how to be a king when you have no kingdom. Sometimes you have to learn to be a king when you have no subjects. Sometimes you have to learn to be a king in the darkness and the silence and the solitude of the wilderness in a cave that pain has chased you to. The cave's gonna become David's sanctuary. It's gonna become his classroom. It's gonna become basic training. It's gonna become the place where God forges David into the man that he wants him to be, that he needs him to be for the assignment that he's called him to. And the same may be true in your life. And the same may be true in my life. That maybe you're in a moment, maybe you're in the season where you feel like you've been chased into the wilderness, you've been driven into a cave, and it was pain that chased you there, it was difficulty that chased you there, it was adversity that chased you there, but God chased you there in order to get you silent, in order to get you alone, in order to get you to the place where you could learn some things that you could not learn anywhere else that God began to take away the crutches in your life and my life that we typically lean on and depend on, that he takes away those crutches, he drives us to the wilderness in order to teach us what only we can learn in a cave, in a barren wilderness. So there's some things that David learned and I'm gonna give these to you real quick and we'll pick up here the next time. But this is what David learned. David learned that despite how things look, sound, and feel, God can be trusted. Despite how things look, sound, and feel, God can be trusted. Things looked hopeless, but they weren't. Everything looked like one big mistake, but it wasn't. Everything looked meaningless and without purpose, but it wasn't. He felt forsaken, but he wasn't. He felt forgotten, but he wasn't. He felt ignored, but he wasn't. He felt defeated, but he wasn't. He felt unloved, but he wasn't. He felt doomed, but he wasn't. And he learned that despite how I feel, despite how things sound, and despite how things look, God can be trusted because sometimes I cannot be trusted to know what is real and what isn't based on what I see, what I hear, and what I know. And David learns in the cave, in the wilderness, that God can be trusted. 
Something else that David learned is this, that feelings, feelings lead me, lead you to take matters into our own hand. But faith leads me to trust matters into God's hand. David goes to Nob, he lies to Ahimelech, He's gonna cost Ahimelech his life, his family's life, the other priests, their lives. He's taking matters into his own hands until God drives him into the cave and it's gonna be in the cave that God teaches him, hey, this is bigger than your hands. So trust these matters into my hand. Trust my plan, trust my timing and trust my way. David, I've got a plan for your life and it's probably a bit different than what your plan would be. And my plan, it's on my timing. So yeah, you might be on the run for eight years, but David, trust me. Trust me with my timing. And I know that this is uncomfortable, this is painful, and this is not how you would have constructed it, but this is the way that I wanna do it, and I need you to trust me. This is what David's learning. And in the end, in the end David learned that when things feel bleakest, God is closest. When things feel bleakest, God is closest. And he would pin in another Psalm, in another poem, he would say, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are of a contrite, crushed spirit. Pain drove David into the wilderness, into a cave where he was left with only himself and God. When all the other crutches had been taken away, David began to learn that God, his heavenly father, was all he needed. That there was a purpose in the pain that God was allowing. And this pain was gonna shape David and teach David everything that he was gonna need to know and was gonna make him everything he needed to be to be the king that God had destined him to be. And David learned when all hell breaks loose, and I can't control any of it. I'm left with only option, one option, and that's to trust God and to believe that he's in control of everything. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would encourage us, teach us, shape us, correct us from this season of David's life. Holy Spirit, take whatever needs to stick in our hearts and drive it deep in and let us wrestle with it and let it change us. Holy Spirit, help us to hold on to what we need to hold on today so that we can be the men and women that you've called us to be for the destiny that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said,